Chapter 34, Administering Oral, Topical, and Inhalant Medications. I'm going to skip over the objectives. You guys can read those at your own leisure. So we have uh, nursing responsibilities in uh, medication administration. You want to always remember to be accurate during all steps of medication administration. Medication errors can occur in several steps during to during the administration process. We always have to interpret the order. We have to identify our patient. We need to verify the administration route, the dose, and we need to watch and make sure that we aren't um, committing any errors. And if so, we want to document our errors. Um, we want to follow our procedures exactly. Again, report any errors if they occur. Interpret the medication order correctly. Give the medication correctly to the patient. Make an, an assessment of the patient before and after medications have been administered. And always, always follow the six rights of medication administration. Policies designate time of day corresponding to the frequency ordered by the physician. Uh, routine or scheduled medication orders. So um, we want to make sure that we are maintaining a desired level of medication in the bloodstream, often several times a day. If it's a routine med, that's how we do it. Physician's order will specify how often the medication is to be given. Three times a day is TID. Every four hours is Q4 hour. We also have BID, which is twice a day. QD, which is once daily. Um, and then you'll see Q4 hour, Q6 hour, Q8 hour, Q12 hour, so on and so forth. PRN medication orders. PRN medication orders specify when or how often the medication can be given. PRN in particular means as needed. Um, we give those in response to a patient's request or when the need is indicated, like for pain or let's say um, for acid reflux, um, diarrhea, constipation. A lot of those are PRN um, examples of when we would give something that is ordered PRN or as needed. If you see HS PRN, that means hour of sleep as needed, so at bedtime as needed. Q4 hours PNs means as needed every four hours or as often as every four hours as needed. One time single and stat medication orders. One time is um, where we're only supposed to give the drug just one time, that's it. Um, it may consist of more than one drug or may involve spacing drops or tablets over a short period of time. Stat orders indicate that the order has top priority and the medication must be administered without delay. We oftentimes use stat orders in emergency when a patient's condition has suddenly changed. Renewal orders, excuse me. Many hospitals have medication policies limiting the time for which certain um, types of medication orders are valid. At the end of a specified time, the order is no longer considered valid and no additional doses of the drugs may be given. So, the doctor will have to renew the order. Opioid analgesics, good example. They generally have a 48 to 72 hour limit. Sedatives and antibiotics may have a five or seven day limit. A 30 day limit may be imposed by some agencies on all medications. You see that a lot in the LTC or uh, rehab. 
Orders by protocol may exist in specialty units such as the emergency department, labor and delivery, or intensive care units. Students must be able to recognize an emergency situation immediately and report it to their instructor or charge nurse. So you guys know that I come from ED. So just an example of orders by protocol, we have like a stroke order set, we have an MI order set, and what that means is there's um, a list of orders. If a person is having a stroke, we put in the stroke order set in all of the orders that it's like a cookie cutter list of orders that we're going to utilize. And almost all the orders are going to be valid and the doctor will go through and take things out or add things in. You can um, tailor it to an individual situation more but it is the cookie cutter or the skeleton of the order set. Dosages uh, may be ordered in the metric system, most often used, or in the apothecary system. Nurses must be able to calculate the dosage in either system. Nurses must be able to convert from one system to the other. Checking conversions with another nurse may prevent medication errors from conver conversions. Um, the other thing I want to say about dose or drugs in general is anytime you have any doubt, you should always consult your pharmacist. Call your pharmacy, call, speak to your pharmacy tech, and if you need to speak to a, um, excuse me, a pharmacist, they will put one on the line for you. Make sure you know how to use your resources. Routes of oral medications. We're going to use PO, which is by mouth, solid or liquid medications, oral, sublingual, buccal, or via feeding tube. What is buccal? That's going to be in the cheek. Okay. Uh, patients with difficulty in swallowing may need pills crushed or changed to liquids. So if we can change a medication to a liquid form, that's a good idea for our patients who have difficulty swallowing. Medications that should not be crushed, remember this, this is testable information. We cannot crush sublingual medications, enteric coated medications, and sustained release medications. Routes of topical medications are applied in the form of drops, either eye or ear, ointments, pastes or lotions, rectal suppositories, uh, transdermal medications. Um, if we're giving something transdermal that's on the skin, we have to make sure that we're putting it somewhere where there is no hair. It's very important. And then last but not least, topical medications do include inhalants. Medication administration and technology. Um, definitely technology has improved medication administration safety. Uh, computerized physician order entry systems, CP CPOE, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is prescriber, the prescriber directly enters the medication order in the computer. This decreases the potential for transcription errors. This has helped us a lot as nurses. Um, you know, eliminate those interpretations we used to have to do for the handwriting of the doctors. We no longer have to do that. Not, not really. Uh, barcode scanners scan the medication package and the patient ID bands. Smartphones and mobile devices. How many of you guys have my chart? Um, that's the way of the world, right? Personal digital assistants download and upload specific patient information to a PDA that is connected to a larger hospital information system. We have three different types of medication administration systems. You have stock supply of medications, individual medication systems, and a unit dose method. We're going to talk about each of these three individual. Let's start with unit dose system. It provides pre-measured, pre-packaged, pre-labeled doses. 
It is the safest because the dose prescribed is the dose dispensed. May be dispensed from a mobile cart or a fixed medication preparation center. The benefit to this system is that the pharmacy supplies the exact dose of the medication ordered. It saves time for the nurse. The patient is charged only for medications used. It allows keeping a minimum amount of drugs on the nursing units. Here is a picture of some of the medications that were dispensed by the unit dose um, system. You have um, acetaminophen, so this is Tylenol. Uh, Prepackaged, each little section has one little pill that is one tablet that's 325 milligrams. If you can read that, you see the name, the dose, the expiration date. Then you have a four pack of medication pills down here. Right in the middle, you have a suppository. Right above that, looks like some breathing, maybe some albuterol or something like that. So we have pill forms, we have liquid forms, we have tablets, we have injectables in this picture. The prescription sim um, system is similar to the unit dose system, except that a sufficient number of doses for several days is, a, is supplied. Um, the prescription is written for each drug ordered and filled by the pharmacist who provides individual containers holding doses for several days. We usually use this in a long-term care facility. A week's or month supply of each medication is often provided in a bubble pack. Um, a significant advantage of this system is that the user name and password or biometric identification system, which is a fingerprint, um, we're talking about uh, controlled substance from a dispenser um, system. Um, this eliminates the problem of having to find the nurse who has the keys to the locked cabinet, and it also, in it also helps with efficiency. So a controlled dispensing system is used for distributing opioid analgesics and hypnotics. Legally controlled substances must be under lock and key. That's why these systems are so nice. Automated controlled substance dispensing machines are often used in the clinical setting to monitor and control narcotic use. When not in a dispensing machine, drugs are supplied in a controlled dispenser or a commercially prepared package. Here's um, a picture of a Pixis machine. This is what we typically see now on our um, units and in our facilities. Question number one, which medication system is most commonly used in the healthcare agencies? Number one, stock supply, two, individual prescription system, three, unit dose method, or four, pharmacy profile. Uh, the answer is number three, the unit dose system is considered the safest and the most commonly used. It provides one dose at a time. Stock supplies are rarely used today. Individual prescription systems have several days supplied at one time and aren't as cost effective as the unit dose method. A pharmacy profile lists a patient's allergies and the medication a patient is on, but it's not a type of administration system. Question number two, narcotic orders are good for how long before a physician in a hospital setting must renew them? And the correct answer is B, 48 hours. Opioid analgesics orders have a 48 to 72 hour limit, the physician must give or write a renewal order to continue the medication. All right, second part of chapter 32. Let's just move right into it. Uh, we're gonna talk about topical drugs. Um, common forms of topical drugs include ointments, creams, paste, uh, liniments, 
and lotions that are used to treat local conditions. Suppositories are small cylinder shaped semi-solid substances that are inserted into the body orifices and contain medication that is absorbed through mucous membranes. Medications can also be dissolved in solutions and applied um, topically in form of irrigations. Drug solutions instilled in the eye, the ear, and the nose are topical and act locally on these tissues, but they may also have a systemic effect on the patient. Drops and ointments for the eye must be sterile and non-irritating to the tissues. When we uh, think about the nursing process, nurses must question unclear, incomplete, or ambiguous medication orders. So anything you don't understand, you need to question. Complete drug orders must contain the full name of the patient, the name of the drug, how it is to be given, the dose to be given, and the route of administration, the date, the time, and the signature of the prescribing physician. Uh, we also must determine how our nursing diagnoses are related to each of the prescribed medication. So when you start your clinicals, you guys, and when you start your SIMS next term, it's really important that you look at your patient's medication list. And before you even look at their history, you want to look at their medications and say to yourself, okay, this guy has high cholesterol, he's got high blood pressure. You want to start familiarizing yourself with the medications and what you expect to be wrong with the patient. Um, <clears throat> when we are assessing our patient um, for medication administration, we want to assess what the patient knows about each of the medications and we also want to decide do they need more teaching do they need to learn more about their medications we want to assess for any side effects of the drug if um, the previous doses have been given so if they've been taking it for a while let's see if they're having any side effects we want to assess for drugs that must be given with food or on an empty stomach so that the timing of the dose will be appropriate we have to always check on NPO status, meaning NPO means nothing by mouth, because remember, PO means by mouth, N means nothing, nothing by mouth. So if our patient has been moved to nothing by mouth, then they cannot take anything by mouth. Sometimes people have NPO status excluding meds so they can take their meds but they can't take anything else by mouth um, anytime we are giving topical medications uh, we have to assess for adverse effects such as inflammation swelling redness or discharge that's very important We want to plan and incorporate times for medication administer, administration into our daily work schedule. We need to check the label three times. So we're going to check, do our three checks at the chart, the cart, and the bedside. And we're going to follow our six rights when we're preparing our medications. Our six rights are the right patient. We're going to use two identifiers. And we're going to ask if they have any allergies the right medication, the right dose, the right route, the right time, and the right documentation. Oral medications um, include uh, tablets, capsules, spatules, lozenges, gel caps, caplets, oral powders, tixtures, emulsions, and liquids. So does anybody know what a spansool is? It's like a time release pellet put into a capsule. What forms of liquid medications can be given? It's going to be syrups, elixirs, suspensions. So all of that is is very important that you familiarize yourself with the different types. Any water that is used must be entered on the intake sheet if the patient is on intake and output recording. 
We want to pour the dose into a graduated medicine cup when preparing our liquid medications. Here is a great picture of a medicine cup, and we're going to measure at the meniscus, at the meniscus of the liquid. So we want to make sure that we're looking at our medicine cup at eye level. We don't want to go below. We don't want to go above. We want to uh, make sure our medication is right in line with whatever the dose prescribed is. All right, so when we are administering eye and ear medications, ophthalmic or eye medications may be in the form of drops, ointment, or eye disc. The word ophthalmic must be clearly visible on the container. Otic or ear medications are usually administered as drops or irrigations. When the ear canal is straightened, the medication be, can be delivered more effectively. So in adults, we're gonna pull the pinna of the ear up and back. When we administer to children, it's down and back. Nasal medications. Inhalants and nasal medications may have a systemic and local effect. Drugs used for the systemic effect are in the form of a fine mist or a gas and may be administered under pressure to have immediate effect on the large surface of the lungs. The local effect may be used in the form of medicated steam or fumes. So nasal medications oftentimes come in um, atomizers or atomic um, I call it atomizers or dropper bottles. So I don't know if any of you, you know, we all live in Ohio, so a lot of us have um, sinus issues. So this is just nasal sprays, guide nasal sprays. So when we're giving a nasal spray, we're gonna have the patient close or block one nostril and then inhale through the nose as the atomizer is squeezed. Drops should be administered when uh, with the patient lying on the back with the neck hyperextended while the medication is dropped into the nostrils. That's if we're doing drops, okay, not um, an atomizer. Here is a picture of drops being given. Inhalation medications may be administered through a nebulizer spray or atomizer to penetrate the lungs. Metered dose inhalers, um, our prescribed amount of medication is administered in each spray. It is held in front of the mouth and the medication is inhaled as the inhaler is triggered. Um, inhalers always work a little bit better if we use a spacer. Here is a great picture with an inhaler and a spacer being used. The yellow part of this is the inhaler. The um, greenish blue with the clear in the middle, that is all that part of it is considered a spacer. Vaginal medications, there's um, three ways of administering vaginal medications and the therapeutic advantages of them. Um, we'll talk about those. Uh, we use medica vaginal medications to cleanse the vagina for surgery, reduce bacterial growth, remove or odors and discharge, apply heat or cold to inflamed tissues, and absorb medication into the local mucosa. So here is two forms of how we insert uh, vaginal medications. You see one is a suppository, the second is a cream using an applicator. Rectal medications are dispensed in, in the form of suppositories 
to prevent vomiting, soothe hemorrhoids, prevent bladder spasms, promote bowel evacuation, and reduce fever. Here's a, a good picture of inserting a rectal suppository. So when we are giving a rectal suppository, we are going to, you see, we're not going to push straight into the rectum. We're going to go along the wall, along the wall of the rectum instead of straight inside. That is the proper technique for administering a rectal suppository. Um, topical skin medications are supplied in the form of lo lotions, ointments, creams, and patches. Um, they can be applied to the skin. They should be applied to clean, hairless area and left in place. Patches are designed to gradually release medications for five to seven days. They should be placed on inactive parts of the body, for example, the abdomen, the hip, the upper thigh, we want to avoid the limbs. Transdermal medications are medications that are absorbed through the skin. They're supplied in sustained release patches that are applied to clean, dry, hairless skin and left in place, or as a, um, a paste that is spread over the small, a small area of the skin. Um, if we have to administer medications through a feeding tube, um, when would we do this? We would do that if a patient is unable to swallow meds. Uh, meds that are in the liquid form are the best. Sometimes we have to open our capsules. Sometimes we have to crush tablets um, if that's what we need to do. And sometimes we need to aspirate liquid from a capsule if there if there's liquid in the capsules um, tablets can be used in place of liquids if need be we do not want to mix meds with formula or a tube feeding we mix meds if we're going to crush them we mix them with um, sterile water in the United States it's an estimated 1.5 million patients are harmed each year by medication errors in spite of all the safeguards. Um, the nurse who discovers the error is the one to report it and fill out the report. Therefore, the nurse who made the error may not be the same nurse who reports it and fills out the occurrence. All medication errors must be reported. An incidence, incident or occurrence form is filled out for the medication error that is different than the patient chart, right? We also must make sure that we call the doctor. We have to notify the physician. Orders are carried out to safeguard the patient. Maybe we have to give something to counter counteract what we gave. Maybe we need to do some other interventions to counteract the medication that was given, like hang fluids or um, maybe we need to give the patient um, juice because maybe we gave them something to make their sugar go down. So whatever it is, we have to document that. The goal is to prevent harm to the patient from the error and to prevent similar errors from happening again. Question number three. Paige is getting ready to administer eardrops to a two-year-old girl. When administering eardrops, it is important to remember to... Number one, pull the earward earlobe down and straight and straighten the canal. Number two, pull the ear earlobe upward to straighten the canal. Three, pull the earlobe toward the back of the head to straighten the canal. Or four, none of the above. Remember, in kids, we're going to pull the earlobe down and straight back to straighten the canal. So for a child younger than the age of three, pull the earlobe downward to straighten the canal. In an adult, you're going to pull the top of the pinna out and up. Question four. Allison is getting ready to administer her patient's medication through a feeding tube. Which types of medications cannot, cannot be crushed 
or administered through a feeding tube. Number one, buccal, sublingual, and liquid. Two, liquid, sublingual, enteric coated. Three, sublingual, enteric coated, or sustained release. Or four, liquid, sustained release, and suppository. Okay, answer is gonna be number three. Medications that should not be crushed or administered through a feeding tube are sublingual, enteric coated, and sustained release medications. Sublinguals are placed under the tongue and absorbed by the vessels in the oral mucosa. Enteric coated have a special coating that does not dissolve until the medication reads, reaches the intestine. Crushing it would allow it to be absorbed before reaching the intestines. Sustained release medication should not be crushed because the proper desired sustained effect of the medication would be compromised. 